right, we will of course continue to track all the conversations that are taking place on the sidelines of the BRICS summit. But uh, to talk really of what's happened today in terms of the India-Russia deal, of course, India and China and the whole uh, elephant in the room so far as Pakistan and terror goes, we are joined by a fantastic panel here. Nandan Unni Krishnan, senior fellow ORF, uh, joins us uh, from Delhi. Dhruva Jay Shankar, fellow for foreign policy, Brookings Institution, India Center, and C. Raja Mohan, the director of Carnegie India, join us here in the studio. Gentlemen, thank you all for joining us here today for this discussion. Uh, clearly, we started off with uh, India and Russia and Vladimir Putin and uh, Narendra Modi speaking. Now, uh, Xi Jinping's also joined the mix, so to say. It's really been a day of personalities, and uh, we've seen that all three of these men uh, command a certain attention uh, when it comes to the way they present themselves. All three are known as hawkish global leaders. Just talk us through, I'll come to each of you one by one. Uh, let's start with you, Dhruva. Talk us through the significance of their personalities, really. Uh, we're going to play out some visuals, of course, as we continue this conversation. So, of course, uh, I think we have, in some ways, three leaders in, in Putin, Xi, and Modi who are... Uh, all have very strong mandates uh, in their own ways, in their, in their own countries. Um, they represent a new generation um, in, in their country's leaderships. Um, in, ma in that sense, they have much in common. Um, but I think we've seen in some ways that's n that personal relationships have uh, can either be uh, an, uh, a means of improving relations between two countries, sometimes when two leaders see, see eye to eye, but, but in many ways you can also see a clash of personalities. Um, I think it was interesting to see some of the visuals around uh, uh, Prime Minister Modi's meeting with Vladimir Putin in particular. Um, that, uh, I mean, this is a relationship I think that many people were concerned about as having deteriorated a little bit, or at least been drifting apart. Uh, Russia and India having less and less in common, uh, despite having a very special relationship on the defense side. Uh, but I think what we, we, with some of the announcements we've seen in the last, uh, just, just today, and, and, and we had hints of some of them yesterday, uh, that I, I think we, we could uh, be seeing a, a gradual improvement in, mm -hmm. in the relationship, at least uh, trying to bring it back uh, front and center in, in terms of uh, India's global priorities. Right. Do you agree, uh, sir? Exactly. I mean, I think uh, we have these three leaders. I mean, I think there is one word to describe them is hardball. Mm -hmm. uh, playing hardball politics at home, muscular approaches to international relations, are ready to think very big uh, and to do deals, uh, if possible, wherever they can. Or, I mean, uh, make it quite clear that uh, they can't go along with certain certain things. So I think the, and the meeting, I think, uh, comes at a point, I think, as Dhruva said, where actually uh, India-Russia relationship was going through a, a difficult moment, uh, given the uh, exercises uh, that the Russian military was doing for the first time. Uh, unfortunately, in the very week that uh, India-Pakistan were having tensions, so therefore, uh, I think this meeting was important and what we saw happen today was a complete reassurance and a signal that, look, there's much more uh, that India and Russia can do together uh, and that, as the PM said today, uh, one old friend uh, is better than two new friends. Right. So I think a, a reaffirmation. But I think from what I heard from Vikas Farup, uh, the spokesman, uh, the India-China relationship, uh, he's, he's hinted at it, he's, he's in a very difficult moment. Uh, we having friction with the Chinese on on the border, on the economic issues, on regional issues, and on global issues. And I think the Chinese have shown no quarter to India's concerns so far. So I think uh, we don't know what actually happened, but my sense is the relationship is headed to a, a difficult moment, and I think there will be big choices uh, to be made uh, in the coming years. Right, let's also get uh, Nandan Unikrishnan to join us on the conversation. Nandan, I'm sure you've heard what Dhruva and uh, Mr. Raja Mohan had to say about uh, so far as this relationship between India and R Russia and India and China goes. Now, we've seen uh, perhaps positive visuals have come our way from Goa so far as Mr. Putin and Mr. Modi goes. But when it comes to that relationship with India and China, do you predict what Mr. Raja Mohan is saying that uh, we are going to see a difficult uh, sort of tide that's going to affect both nations going forward? No, I would uh, tend to agree with uh, Dr. Rajamohan on most points that uh, one is, uh, you know, there is a great echo coming back. I can't hear anything. I can't even hear myself. Okay, we're going to try and fix that for you uh, right away. But why don't you go ahead and give us uh, your thoughts? Okay, I'll, I'll try and do that. Uh, the, the point is that 
As far as the relationship between India and Russia is concerned, I think we are over the hump. This meeting seems to signify that the two leaders have addressed some of the issues of concern. And it appears that India has been uh, reassured that uh, we are still important to Russia and that Russia sees us as, uh, as Mr. Putin put it, special privileged partner. <clears throat> as far as our relationship with China is concerned, I undoubtedly agree with Dr. Rajamohan that there are difficult days ahead, except that I would like to point out that uh, in the longer term, if we look at China, we should not jump to declare them our enemy yet. China could play a fairly important role in our development, and growth and development today are, I think, our primary challenge. India's India's main challenge today is internal. It is not external. Right, uh, Dhruva, let's, uh, let's talk more about that. In terms of uh, the geopolitical uh, conversation that's happening, uh, can India really afford to, uh, well, isolate is perhaps too strong a word to use here, but does it have to change its policy toward China in terms of the fact that there is, of course, trade between the two countries, mm -hmm. in terms of uh, where China stands in the Asia region? It obviously commands a great deal of, uh, uh, let's say, heft mm -hmm. in this case. Does India have to uh, sort of negotiate very carefully as to how it approaches China? Well, you know, I think uh, about a year or two ago, if one were to give an assessment of India-China relations, uh, we, we would find areas of commonality or congruence. Two of those areas uh, would have been on bilateral economic relations, you know, trade and investment, and on uh, multilateral issues. Uh, global governance, I mean, BRICS being one, one out, outcome of that, uh, but also issues such as climate change, global trade, cybersecurity, and so forth. In the last two years, I think we've seen a deterioration on both those ends. We've seen, uh, despite talk of uh, reorienting the Chinese economy, which should actually be a win-win situation for India and China. India is looking for investment. And, and I think we heard uh, Ambassador Vijay Gokhale, uh, India's ambassador to Beijing, actually say mention that, that you know, I think one area that has been uh, quite good has been uh, an increase in Chinese investment to India, FDI to India, uh, in the last two years. But apart from that, we haven't really seen, we've seen the trade deficit widen. We've seen uh, Indian firms have, still struggling to access Chinese markets. Um, so I, I'm not sure we've seen a positive story necessarily on the economic front where we should be seeing one. And similarly on multilateral issues, uh, we've seen for various reasons India and China parting ways in, in various ways. And I think the, 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 the ultimate uh, demonstration of that came at the Nuclear Suppliers Group meeting in Seoul Absolutely. earlier this year, yes. um, where I think we, the important questions now being raised as to whether China really, despite what it says publicly, would really like to see India uh, at the high global high table uh, and whether it, it's, it's actually willing to encourage uh, or, or willing to be party to India's rise. Uh, so I, th I think there are serious questions about that. And that doesn't, of course, include areas where we do have a level of existing distrust or competition, right. one being on the border. Uh, which has been managed, but where we ha where there is lingering distrust, obviously, and, and concerns, and and mo most so on regional issues. And I think uh, we saw Xi Jinping visit Bangladesh, mm -hmm. and uh, I think some of the outcomes there, I think, would be causing a certain amount of trepidation in New Delhi. Right. Uh, sir, also, as uh, Dhruva just mentioned, the NSG, of course, has been a major block in terms of uh, the improvement of that relationship. Add to that the fact that China has again gone and extended that technical hold so far as Masood Azhar goes. So this. Uh, this whole conversation about terror, NSG, these are going to be uh, perhaps points that indicate what you were saying in your uh, earlier answer mm -hmm. as well. Look, I think the, uh, the Chinese feel they owe nothing to us. They owe nothing to anyone, in fact. Uh, they, they don't see they need to owe anything to the Americans, to the Filipinos, to the Vietnamese. Uh, there is a sense of self-importance and self-confidence in China as the second largest economy, a second largest military power, and that they can have the way. And it's up to you to accommodate to their interests. Right. So there's very little negotiation. There's been no negotiation. I mean, we've been talks, but there's been no signal of any flexibility on the NSC issue, on the terror issue. What they say is the last word. It's up to you. And I think the problem is this. I think uh, we fundamentally underestimated the nature of Chinese power and the impact of Chinese power on our environment. 
on our regional environment, on our borders. And I think this has been a tragedy with India that you always think somehow there is something else, a multilateral domain, a shared Asian perspective, developing countries, changing the world. Are these kind of self-delusional rhetoric, we've tried to hide our differences under rhetoric, under supreme, you know, kind of larger, grandiose slogans. Right. But the challenge is, look, the differences are clear and they're not hiding them. It's not as if the Chinese are being deceitful. Mm -hmm. They're being fairly open. Mm -hmm. They're being fairly clear what Pakistan means for them and what they would like to do in our neighborhood. So it's up to us. You said, should we change our policy? Yes. But question is, in what direction? How? Do we accommodate and say, look, you're, you're the boss. We're number two. Let's accept that. Or do you say, India can't accept a Sinocentric region and that it would balance uh, the engage balance with other powers. And that's why I think the Russia question becomes so important that India must step up its expansion, uh, expand its cooperation with Russia, with Japan, with the US. It's only when you have a balance, my, my belief is that the Chinese will be reasonable. Till that point, you're going to face the music from the Chinese on every sphere and we better be prepared for it. Right, uh, Nandan Unikrishnan, we just heard also that uh, India did in fact bring up uh, the question of terror as far as Pakistan goes in that meeting with uh, China. And uh, what do you think is going to be the stance so far as China is concerned? Keeping in mind, we've, we've seen that uh, the region has sort of spoken up when the SARC summit was called off in Islamabad, uh, condemning Pakistan in not so many words about uh, it being a harbor for terror. What exactly are we hoping that India is hoping to achieve so far as this conversation on terror goes with Pakistan w while speaking with China is there going to be any sort of achievable consensus here well one is <clears throat> I think I would agree with Dr. Rajamohan that we seriously underestimated Chinese power its rise and the implications it will have for the region I would also agree with him that uh, Therefore, we need to expand our relationships with uh, all available powers in Asia, be it Japan, Indonesia, Russia, and others. And in this context, if we look at uh, the situation in South Asia today, <clears throat> I would imagine that the only way uh, we can get China to relent its current position on Pakistan is to try and apply greater international pressure on it. I do not think it's going to happen today. <clears throat> I do not think it's going to happen at the Goa summit, although, of course, they will arrive at a consensual document and there will be a good words spoken about terrorism. But this is going to be a long haul. And in that, I completely agree with Dr. Rajamon. Right. But coming back to uh, what we started off on, which is personalities, is Narendra Modi the personality to drive home that point with China? Uh, that's a good question. I mean, I think it would be one of the biggest tests, at least foreign well, policy tests for... All right. Uh, no. Nandan, go ahead. We'll, we'll come back to you, Dhruva. Nandan, go ahead. We'd love to hear what you say. Well, you know, you know, we have a situation that all three leaders have very strong personalities. If you look at the reports in international media, there is talk of the Chinese leader probably challenging the uh, tradition that the Chinese secretary of the party gives up power after two terms, that we, we are looking at the possibility that Xi Jinping may continue. Uh, of course, uh, President Putin is likely to be there till uh, 2024. But we must remember that in this Troika, the only democracy is India. And Mr. Modi comes under the pressures and vagaries of the Indian political system. He has the personality, he has the ability to uh, mold or shape our country's uh, policies, but he also has to keep in mind what is happening internally. And this is a pressure from which I guess in some ways his uh, counterparts are free. Uh, so how he manages to balance what he has to do inside India the deliverables that he has to look at within India and how he measures foreign policy into that is going to be the critical question. So far, I would uh, admit that I think that he's doing a pretty good job of it. Right. Uh, but 
Dhruva, you were you were saying something before we went across mm -hmm. to Nandan. I, I, I would I would agree with uh, Nandan uh, uh, considerably on this. I mean, but uh, a few points though. I, one area I would disagree perhaps is uh, the notion that uh, Xi Jinping, and I, I can't speak so much for Putin, but uh, have uh, the, the lack of domestic opposition to them. Um, in fact, uh, you know, the, f the very fact that Xi Jinping is, is bucking a lot of trends in terms of what is expected of uh, the, the, the president of China uh, is actually also leading to considerable resentment within his own party. And it will be difficult for him to manage that uh, going forward as well. I mean, is, uh, there, there's some estimates by people who do watch developments in Beijing very carefully that he spends up to about 80% of his time managing domestic affairs. Right. And really only a small p portion of his time is really spent on economic policy, mostly One Belt, One Road, uh, which is sort of a pet project, and on foreign policy, which is, of course, a dimension of that as well. Um, but it's, um, but uh, I mean, this will be a significant test uh, for, for, for three leaders in terms of managing their own domestic uh, situations as well, not just uh, Prime Minister Modi. But on, on in terms of is Modi the person to manage China? I mean, this will, I, I imagine, be one of his biggest. Um, uh, biggest tests going forward. The other one, in fact, will actually be managing relations with Russia. Um, we've seen, uh, you know, the, the the central element of India-Russia relations in the past few years has been a defense, a, a very special defense relationship yes. that continues to this day. We've seen a gradual erosion of that as India has diversified away f in, in, and started seeking um, military uh, imports from other other sources. Uh, in fact, uh, between. Uh, we had a two-year period where you saw an almost 20% increase in, in terms of India's total imports coming from the U.S. Um, and this was largely a few very big platforms, particularly aircraft, uh, in terms of uh, imports. So I think we'll have to be managing that in the future, uh, in terms of both in terms of um, uh, ensuring that we maintenance and, and, and supplies for India's, the current equipment that India has from Russia, and then also future development projects uh, as well. Uh, keeping that in mind, the, key, the defense deals that were signed today were, are obviously going to be very key in that yeah. uh, development of that relationship. Exactly. I mean, I think uh, going back to the earlier point, I mean, what you said, uh, I think Prime Minister Modi has a handicap vis-a-vis, -vis, say, Tsar Putin and uh, Emperor Xi, uh, that there is a domestic dynamic which an Indian Prime Minister has to handle. He has to go for an election, which the other two... Uh, I mean, they can win the elections much easier, but well, there will be domestic opposition. China has politics. But I think the, there is a problem, uh, the nature of your polity gives some problems. But within those constraints, I would say uh, Modi has been one of the stronger leaders that we've had probably for the first time since uh, Rajiv Gandhi, that you have someone who has a strong mandate at home and he's willing to experiment with initiatives. In that sense, he's well equipped compared to the last uh, you know, 30 years. Governments were weak. They were coalition governments. So in that sense, he's, he's stronger. And I think what he's also shown in the last two and a half years is that he's willing to play real politics, I mean, that he's not burdened by you know, the wimpy, you know, mishy-mashy stuff about non-alignment, about third worldism. Uh, I think he's positioning India to play great power politics in a far more serious way that he's willing to stand in the U.S. Congress right. and say, look, historic hesitations are over. Mm -hmm. But he's willing to push the Indian system to liberalize visas for the Chinese. So this is a very different approach, mm -hmm. that you're willing to open up for economic relations with China. Uh, you're willing to expand your defense cooperation with the, with, the, with the Americans. And now you've seen you're going to do more Make in India on the defense side with the, with the, with the Russians. So I think this is a more, uh, shall we say, a balance of power, approach rather than the ideological, vague, kind of uh, self-delusional rhetoric we used to mm -hmm. indulge ourselves in. Right. Uh, to borrow the term that you just uh, used, let's go across to Nandan Unikrishnan. So far as uh, Tsar Putin goes, uh, the conversations we've heard on the global front really, let's, let's talk a little bit about the American elections, for instance. There's a, there's a great deal of fear that Russia and uh, the name Putin inspires in, uh, we've seen in the, in the conversations happening, especially with the respect to uh, Hillary Clinton. But when it comes to India and Russia, it seems that Mr. Modi has been able to achieve a, uh, an interesting sort of relationship uh, of equals uh, with the, or are we sort of uh, jumping the gun by saying that? Well, actually, uh, <clears throat> I think uh, depending on where uh, you stand in a sense, but the fact is that 
India does not benefit from the tensions between Russia and the West. That is point number one. And therefore, if we have the ability, we must try and uh, make this point clear to both the Russians as well as to our Western partners that tensions between them are not in India's interest. That is uh, point number one. Uh, point uh, number two is, I, I mean, coming back to China, uh, the Indo-Russian relationship, if you go back, to the 60s. late 50s and early 60s started on the premise of China. We were going through a war with China, we had 62. The Russians were going through a breakup of relations or deterioration of relations between two communist countries. Subsequently, it has been that glue that has kept us together. I have a strong suspicion that despite uh, some concerns to the contrary, that Russia's con uh, suspicions or concerns about China have not dissipated. But because of the deterioration of the relationship with the West, they are tactically forced to move closer. <clears throat> Obviously, any tactical movement has unintended consequences also, and maybe the Russians are getting too close to China from our point of view. But again, I believe that it is up to us to decide for ourselves uh, what is in our interest. And one of the things that is in our interest is to reach out to countries like uh, Russia, Japan, and try and develop independent right. relations, relationships with them that are not necessarily influenced by other relations we have. Mr. Rajamohan, keeping time in mind, I know that uh, we can't have you for the rest of the program. Very quickly, if you can then just uh, sort of uh, respond perhaps to uh, what Mr. Unikrishnan had to say. Exactly. I mean, I think the origins of the Indo-Russian relationship uh, was in the, uh, in the China question. It had less to do with the, uh, with the, with the Americans. The Sino-Soviet split in the 60s and the Sino-Indian conflict uh, coincided, and I think that's been a relationship. Uh, and we've also seen China make vigorous turns. I mean, it was a treaty ally of the United Soviet Union in the 50s, then it drew close to the Americans in the 80s and the 70s and the 80s. So there has been a, a, a dynamism. And I think today, again, like in 71, when we signed the Soviet, Indo-Soviet Treaty, the Chinese get, got closer to the Americans. There is a dynamic shift today that's unfolding. Right. And I think in this, everyone is hedging Everyone is jockeying for position. So this is the moment to be to discard any, you know, ideological shibboleths and focus on, look, what is in our interests? If there's something in our interest with the Chinese, we must do it. Uh, if Russia is willing to give us more technology, we should take it. And if the Americans are willing to help us develop advanced technology, we should do that. So I think it's, it's, that, it's that focus on strengthening India's position. Right. That should be the main question, not about... Is it politically correct? Are we following the old line? Are those issues? Because India has shifted made turns. Chinese have made turns. The Russians have made turns. So it is a jockeying by these three leaders for a new balance in, a, in Eurasia, I would say. All right. So clearly, India uh, must focus on the inward while looking outward as well. On that note, uh, Dr. Rajamohan, thank you so much for joining us. I'll request uh, Dhruva and Nandanuni Krishna to stay on with us. We're going to take a quick break, but we will come back and continue this discussion on India, Russia, China, and those three men in Goa. <laughs>